All righty. Go ahead and open up your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. Uh, we're going to read a few verses in Philippians chapter 1. I'm going to read three verses in Ephesians chapter 1 as well. And then we'll pray. And we'll get right into it. And I'll try and get you out before midnight. <laughs> well before midnight, okay? All right, Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to read verses uh, 3 through 11, and you can follow along. Philippians chapter 4, verse 3 says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. Ephesians chapter 1, I'm going to read three different verses, and I really want to uh, pull out a, a, a phrase that is common throughout these, and we're going to look through the book of Philipp, uh, Philippians tonight. But Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6 says, "...to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved." Verse 12 says that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. And verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance, the Holy Spirit, until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. We're going to look at that tonight, how our lives should be to the praise and glory of God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for mercy and grace. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we can have it and, and read it and hear preaching from it, and I pray that you'd help me tonight as I just share uh, what you've laid on my heart, and speak to our hearts, and help us to live our lives to, to your praise and glory, and help us to see a little bit how we can do that tonight. We love you, thank you for loving us, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so Ephesians chapter 1 and Philippians chapter 1 here, Paul has a very common phrase that he uses a few times, and it's that phrase, it's used a little bit differently, but to the praise of the glory of God. Now, in Ephesians chapter 1, he's talking about salvation and and how the Holy Spirit, that last one is the Holy Spirit is our seal into the day of redemption. And, and you you know, you see that that it speaks about our salvation, but it keeps saying unto the praise and glory of God or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And I'm reminded that our, you know, when Christ saved us, of course, Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for our sins. and, And he did that for the purpose of saving our souls. And God wants us to go to heaven. He really does. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I'm glad for that. Mm -hmm. Now, God didn't just save us, though, and expect us to just be happy with that and sit around and do nothing. Okay, God's given us some commands. God's given us some things He wants us to do. And here we see that we're saved unto the praise and glory of God, or at least we should be unto the praise and glory of God. In the book of Titus, we see that uh, he tells us that, that Christ hath redeemed us unto himself, a peculiar people, zealous of good works. That's what we're supposed to be. God has redeemed us. He's saved us from our sins. He's saved us from eternity in hell. He's given us eternal security and eternal life in heaven. He's given that through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. But he wants us, now that we're saved, to live a life unto his praise and glory, a a life uh, that we are zealous of good works, not good works so that we can go to heaven. That's all finished through the blood of Jesus Christ. But at, uh, I think, uh, is that also in Titus? Maybe in one of the Timothys, somewhere in there. He tells us to to, uh, encourage people to do good, unto good works, I don't remember the exact wording, but he says that ye be not unfruitful. You know, the works that we do, the things that we do for God, it's of course because, it should be at least, because we love God. 
And we want to show him our thanks. But it's also for our own benefit, for our fruitfulness. Our our salvation comes through Jesus Christ, but our good works help us be fruitful in the Lord. And this morning, or it's not morning anymore. I took a nap, so I feel good. (laughs) So we could be here all night. (laughs) Uh, this evening, I want to look at, at how the book of Philippians, and I think Paul really, God uses Paul to really walk through very nicely how our lives can be to the praise and glory of God. Just some different things that I, reading through the book of Philippians here, I just noticed some things that that I thought would be helpful to us to help us just get our lives in a way, live our lives in a way that we can glorify God through the way that we live. So look down if you would. It, all, it needs to start somewhere. And uh, so we're going to start in verse 20. Okay, jump down to verse 20. We're going to really work through the book of Philippians. We're not going to read a whole lot of verses, but enough here and there to, to get the idea of what's going on. Uh, but uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 20, it says, According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also... Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to, to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. All right, let's stop there. Okay, those two verses, they really come down to, to really, I think it can be summed up in one word, focus. It's the right focus. If Paul here, in, especially in verse 21, Paul says... For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, that's a great verse. I'm sure we all like that verse because it's easy to memorize because it's really short. Those are the best verses in the Bible. You know, like, Jesus wept. That was one of the best verses as a kid because, man, you just memorized the verse in the Bible. You feel so good about yourself. But here, you know, it, it's a great verse, but I, I think sometimes we read it and like, oh, yeah, that's cool, whatever. I don't know what that means, but <laughs> moving on. <laughs> But I think it's important to understand what Paul is saying here. He said, for me to live is Christ. Okay, Paul, you can see this in Paul's life. Through Paul's life, from the day he gets saved, he turns his life around as a 180 for God, and he starts living his life as much as he can for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everything he does, he tries to do for God. He, he goes and he, he witnesses to people and he preaches the gospel, even at the risk of his own life. He'd be left for dead several times. He'd be imprisoned more than once. And, and here Paul goes through his life, truly living his life for Christ. His actions in life showed this verse, for me to live is Christ. See, for Paul, the most important thing in life was living for God. It was obeying the the commandments that God had given. It was giving out the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wasn't going to compromise on that. He wasn't going to quit the race. He wasn't going to stop fighting. He was going to finish his course. He was going to fight the fight. And he did, all the way to the end of his life. All the way to the day that Paul would be be executed in Rome. His whole life, ever since from his salvation to, to his death, he just lived for Christ. Because he had a focus on eternity. He had a realization that, that God, that, that Christ was returning, that salvation was, was, that the gospel needed to be given to people. He had a realization that he had, a, he had an understanding that he needed to live his life for Christ, that his life needed to be to the praise and glory of God. So his focus was on eternal things. And that's further evidenced by the rest of the verse. And for me to die is gain. Paul, when he died in Rome, Paul left, he didn't leave everything behind. Paul left nothing for everything. Everything that Paul, every treasure that Paul had laid up was in heaven. Paul traveled with barely anything. He, he, you know, he made tents to, to pay his way until people supported him. And here Paul lives his life investing in eternity. 
He's living his life witnessing to people. He's living his life giving, giving to the Lord, giving of his life and of his means. And, and all of that, he's giving to the Lord. And so at the end of his life, Paul was rich toward God. God. Paul was rich in eternity. He was rich in heaven. He had a wealth in heaven. I can't imagine how much treasure Paul laid up for himself in heaven. You know, Jesus told us, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, or thieves neither break in nor steal. You know, he's the one that's been there. Yeah. He knows what he's talking about. I, I'd take his word for it. I don't know what we're going to spend our treasures on. I have no idea. You know, I've thought about it. I've, I've, I don't know. All I know is we're going to have treasures if, you know, if, if, we, if we're faithful to live for the Lord and we're doing the things that, that he says we need to be doing, then, well, we're laying up treasures in heaven. I don't know what we're going to spend them on, but if Jesus said we need them, well, I'm going to take his word for it. And so here, Paul, in his life, has li- he's lived his entire life with a focus on eternal things. Now, the reason this is important is because if you don't have a focus on eternal things, you're never going to live for God. Because think about it. If I'm not focused on on eternity, on on Christ, on God, on the Bible, if I'm not focused on on souls and, and the gospel being spread throughout the whole world, if I'm not focused on eternal things, what am I focused on? Temporal things. Me. My career, my job, my house, my car, my money. Those are the things that my focus is then shifted to. And when we're, when we're focused on our own well-being, when we're focused on our own career, when we're focused on things of this life, why would we ever live our life to the praise and glory of God? There's no motivation to, because we're focused on ourselves. There's no motivation to give to the Lord, because all we want is what we can get. Because we're focused on earthly things. Now, if if we were to get some sense, then we'd really start giving to God, because, you know, he's told us we'll be better off if we do, and I'm going to take his word for it. And not only that, (laughs) you'll experience it if you do it. (laughs) You know, we, we, we try and, if we don't focus on, on eternal things, we start to focus on the, the things that are part of this temporal life, this vapor that our life is, which appeareth but for a moment and vanisheth away. That's what our life is. That's what treasures here on earth are. They're like a flower. You know, they, they bloom and then they just wither away and die. Well... Had a nice flower for a few years, though. (laughs) I had a big bank account. You know, one of my—I love the the parable in the Bible where Jesus is talking about a rich man who, man, he's had a successful harvest. He's doing really good for himself. He's made some good financial decisions. Boy, oh boy! And he starts talking to himself. You know, he's really arrogant, and he says, "Self." That's what he said. <laughs> there we go. He said, self, or he said to his soul, he said, soul, thou hast done well. You did a good job, buddy. You know, you should take a break. Just build up some barns for yourself to store all this stuff you've got. Man, you're doing good for yourself. <laughs> and the Bible says, thou fool. <laughs> thou fool. Right. This day shall thy soul be required of thee. You know, God took that man home that day. All those barns, all that riches, what was it good for? Nothing. Who's going to spend his money now? Well, not him. Someone else. You know, the same thing can be said of your money, of our career, of our house, of our car. You know, all of the things that we can have in this life, they're so temporal. We can have, you know, you can be the richest man in the world. There are some people in the world that couldn't spend all their money if they tried. 
But what happens when they die in a few years? Well, that money did them a whole lot of good, didn't it? Man, their name's in Wikipedia now. (laughs) Richest man from this year to this year. Yes. Yeah, that does you a whole lot of good in heaven. Or hmm, maybe in hell. (laughs) No. See, we need to get a focus on eternal things. Because it's only then that we'll start living our life to glorify, to the praise and glory of God. It's only then that we'll start laying up treasures, eternal treasures. Treasures that have no end, that they, they don't rust, they don't corrupt, they don't get stolen. You know, you can drive a car, you can have a nice car, but you know, as soon as that car gets hit by another car, it's no longer a nice car, is it? <laughs> a lot of money down the drain. <laughs> Now, that's what our temporal things are, but God wants us to look beyond that. He's created us for something grander. You know, he's, he's, he's redeemed us and saved us for an eternal purpose. Not just so that we can live a comfortable life. He wants us to have a good eternity. Sure. But we need to get our focus on Christ first. Once we get our focus on God, that's when we start to live our lives for Him. We get some perspective. You know, when you think about eternity and you think about your life, think about that real hard for a while. You get a little perspective about how much this is all worth. Look down at verse 27, if you would. This is really where the rubber starts meeting the road. He says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Jesus Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs. That you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. The first phrase says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Okay, the word conversation is our way of life. That's what you do. That's how you act. It's how you live. And the Bible is telling us here that the way we live, should, the way it's worded is, be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. In other words, you ought to live out the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your life should be a picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's never going to be a perfect picture, I know that. But it ought to reflect that. Our conversation, our life needs to be a picture of the gospel. But how do we do that? Well, we could start at the end of the verse where it says, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Chapter 2, verse 2 says, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. You know, when, when God saved us, we became a part of the body of Christ. You know, a body ought to get along. <laughs> you know, bad things start happening with, when a body starts attacking other things within its own self. They're called autoimmune disorders. And there are some churches in the world that have autoimmune disorders because the members of the church, of the body of Jesus Christ, just can't get along. You know, God wants us to be together on this, to have unity, to strive together for the faith of the gospel. Look, we have a common enemy. We have a common goal. Our enemy is Satan. Our goal is the the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we could just get together on those things, maybe we'd start fighting about the little things. If we'd get a little perspective about eternity and about our real enemy and the scope of of the responsibility and privilege we've been given in the gospel of Jesus Christ, if we could get that perspective, maybe some of the little things you have to nitpick about so-and-so, or sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so, eh, they might not seem so important anymore. You know, Satan, Satan 
All Satan has to do is get us to start fighting each other. Then he doesn't have to bother with us. He just goes, all right, who's next? I don't need to worry about that church anymore. They've got their own conflicts. They're fighting their own battles. <laughs> I don't have to be the one they're fighting against. That's not what God wants from us. By this shall men know that you are my disciples, that you have lo love one toward another. Well, I don't like what you do. Oh, yeah, that's really loving. <laughs> that really shows the love of Christ to the world, doesn't it? <laughs> no, God wants us, he tells us here that we'd be of one mind, of one accord. He wants us to agree on things, to be together in this. Striving not against each other, but striving together for the faith of the gospel. We're all in a battle together. Mm -hmm. the, the, spiritual, sure. the spiritual life that we live is a spiritual battle. It's a war. Mm -hmm. And we're fellow soldiers. Mm -hmm. And yet so often we turn our sword against each other. You know, how many times did God do that in the Bible, in the Old Testament, when the armies of Israel would come up against a foe far superior to them, and God would just say, okay, I got this. <laughs> just turns their swords against each other, and Israel just watches as they just slaughter each other, and they don't have to do anything. You know, Satan knows the playbook. He knows the, some of the tactics. He'll use the same thing on us. You know, if we can just fight each other, his job's already half done. As long as we're striving against each other, we're not striving for the gospel. But if we could get together and strive for the gospel of Jesus Christ, man, that would bring glory and praise to the name of God, wouldn't it? Look in uh, chapter 2, verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Okay, the next thing I, I see here... Not only do we need to get along and, and strive together instead of against each other, but, you know, we need to be humble servants. We need to look for the well-being of others, not just ourselves. A little humility goes a long way. <laughs> only by pride cometh contention. If there's, ever, if there's ever church problems because someone's having a pride problem. More than one someone, probably. But here, here we see this beautiful depiction of Christ. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Jesus Christ, God himself, came to be born of a virgin, to live among us with, with all of our sin, with all of our woes and in the pain of a human life, he experienced sorrow and pain and betrayal and loss. And he did that to die on the cross for our sins. But when he came, he came as a servant. Jesus Christ, the God of heaven, came to serve. He could have come as a conquering king. And Praise the Lord, someday he will. I am looking forward to that day. <laughs> more and more. <laughs> you know, when I was younger, I was like, no, he can't come back yet. <laughs> I got to go to college first. I got to get married first. Now I'm like, okay. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> uh, you want to come now? <laughs> but you know, Jesus came to serve. The God of heaven came to serve. And yet we in our pride can't even serve each other. 
we're so concerned about our, ourselves that we don't look out to help other people. No, we, in our pride, we think ourselves better than that. Better than to serve. Better than to, to do the menial tasks. But that's what Christ came to do. To serve. I can't help but think that, you know, what are we saying in our hearts? We would never say it. We wouldn't even really think it. But man, you know what our actions are saying? We're saying, oh, I'm better than that. Better than what? To stoop to the level of Jesus Christ? Are you better than Christ himself that you're too good to serve? That's what our actions say sometimes. We would never say that. We, we with our mouth, will we'll profess that Christ is, is supreme and, and, and there's no one better than him. And then our actions, when Christ came to serve and just wants us to serve other people, our actions speak so differently. Man, if, if we could just get a, a mindset and a heart to serve other people, Instead of being so concerned about what we need, what we want, why don't we go out of our way to see what someone else needs? What someone else wants? Go out of our way to help someone, to serve someone. Christ led through service. We ought to do the same. Chapter 2, verse 15 says that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of, Jesus, uh, in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. You know, it all starts with a focus, a focus on eternal things. Once we've got the right focus, we need to start living the gospel of Jesus Christ. Part of that is, is just getting along with each other. Striving together for a common goal, the, the furtherance of the gospel of Christ. Against a common enemy, Satan, his demons, sin, the world, not people. And then... To have service, humble service. But then I see here, not only do we need to live the gospel, but we need to give the gospel too. Mm -hmm. But can I say this? Living the gospel is a very important part of giving it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard the the the... I don't know, tongue twister. I don't know if it's a tongue twister or not, but I get twisted sometimes. Your, I got to get in the, right, in the right order. Your walk talks and your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Now say that 10 times fast. No, <laughs> don't. <laughs> you know, our actions speak louder than our words do. Our pastor says you're, your words speak, but your, your actions, your life shouts. Our actions, they, they shout. Our actions are so loud. Sometimes, you know, we're trying to give someone the gospel. And they've watched us. And maybe they're saying, I'm sorry, I can't hear what you're saying because your life is saying something different. You know, it's, an, it's a very important part of giving the gospel is, is living for Christ. Because people will watch you. People see how you live. They see if you're faithful to church. They, they see your attitudes, your actions. You know, someone said this. They said, for many people, you are the only Bible they will ever read. Can I ask you this? 
What does that Bible say about your God? If someone only had your life to go off of, and I'm not saying that they should, they should certainly have your word for it too. Man, it is so important. It is a command of God that we give the gospel to every creature. We're supposed to be holding forth the word of life. We're supposed to be giving out the gospel everywhere we go. That is something that God requests. He commands it of us. It's not only our responsibility, it's our privilege. You know, he could have told the angels to do that. And maybe more people would have listened. I don't know. (laughs) But, you know, he chose us to do that. What a responsibility and a privilege. We have the privilege of being the messengers of God to people lost in their sin. But on the other side of the coin... You know, we have a responsibility to live for him, too. You can go through life and you can tell someone how Jesus saves and they can look at your life and say, yeah, sure shows. (laughs) Yeah, Christ can save my life. I can be just like you. Yay. Which is just like me. You know, why should someone in the world who's never known God, why should they believe that you serve a loving, kind God if you're not loving and kind? Why should they believe that that you serve a faithful God who is there when you need Him, when you never show up, you're never there when you're needed, you're never on time? They watch your life. And your life gives them a picture of your God. And man, we can give God a bad name. But we ought to be living our lives. He says, you are the light of the world. That's what Jesus said. He didn't say you could be, you can be. You might be the light of the world. Try hard enough and you'll be the light of the world. No, you are the light of the world. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. We have the Word of God. And whether you like it or not, you're a light where you are. But your light can shine the truth of the gospel. Or your light can give a false representation of the God that we serve. It comes down to the way that we live. Are you living your life to the praise and glory of God? Because if you're not, you ought to start. Can I say this? Living for God is the best life you will ever live. I don't just say that. There there is no better life for you. No life that you can find more peace. No life you can find more joy, more fulfillment, more sense of belonging. All the things that the world seeks for, it's all found in a life that is given to God. You know, by living for Christ, by by walking in the Spirit, we have the fruit of the Spirit. If If we would just do the will of God, we can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's good for us, it's good to us, and it's, well, it's perfect. And you can't get any better than that. You know what that means? Anything that we do for ourselves, for ourselves, outside of the will of God, any life choices we make that take us away from God's will, we're just taking ourselves out of the perfect will of God in our lives the perfect path that God has set us on the best life that we can have anything other than the will of God is second best anything we try any life we try and live for ourselves is second best 
You're worried about your food and your housing and you know the bills and all of that. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all these things shall be added unto you. That is a promise of God. If you would just seek after Him. God promises to provide for us if we would be faithful to give to the Lord. You know, if we would just let God lead our lives, if we would just say, God, I'm going to live my life for you. I'm going to give it to you. Everything I have is yours. You know, it's already His. Why don't you acknowledge it? Why don't you acknowledge to God that everything that you have possession of is His and He can do with it what He wants? If you would just let God lead in your life, if you would be a witness, if you would just live your life the way that God wants you to, a life of, of harmony with other fellow believers, a life of service, a life of obedience to Christ, then our lives can bring praise and glory to the name of God. But I'm going to tell you something. You're going to live the best life you could ever live. And there is no way around that. There, there is no other life than the life that God wants you to live that will be better for you, more enjoyable for you, more fulfilling for you. And we seek those things in the world, but let me just challenge you. Seek those things in Christ. Because only He can bring that. It all comes down to just living our lives to the praise and glory of God so that He can be magnified, so that the people around us can see Christ glorified through our lives. And as we go every step of the way, we can be a witness along the way telling people about the gospel of Jesus Christ and how Jesus saves. And they're going to see something different in our lives. And they're going to want it. We just live it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you for your word. Pray that you'd help us to live our lives to your praise and glory. And uh, Lord, just help us to let you have what is yours, what's rightfully yours. It's only our reasonable service to give our lives a living sacrifice to you. Just to live for you. God, help us to do that and help us to bring praise and glory to your name through all that we do. We love you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you. Pray that you be with us in this time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.